Cool. Uh, wow, there's a lot of people here. Um, great. Well, things have been starting mostly, everyone seems here. Okay, things have been starting basically on time? Okay. okay. Uh -huh. No. Well, one of them was like 20 minutes late because they didn't have the um, room unlocked. Oh. Uh -huh. Who was in that room last time just got out. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, uh, cool. All right, well, um, I'm kind of completely blinded here. Let me see if I can move this a little bit to the side. Oh, no, no, no. I want, to, I want to have this my laptop in a place where I can see it without being blinded. Uh, let's see. Magic happens and it goes right back, right? Exactly. Yeah. Look at that. Um, okay. Uh, cool. Well, Henry, you want to try to grab a seat somewhere, maybe? You can take. I'm not going to need that chair either. If someone wants. Oh, hey. You want to? Sure. Uh, right. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mako Hill, and I uh, I'm very happy that you all came out for this. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction to myself uh, by way of disclaimer, if nothing else. I'm uh, I work at the University of Washington. In my day job, uh, I am a professor in the Department of Communication. And as my night job and often day job for most of, I guess now most of my life, I've been a participant in a bunch of different free software communities. Uh, I was a, been a long time participant in the Debian project. I, uh, since the early 90s, uh, I've been a, uh, I was part of the team that started the Ubuntu project. And uh, I'm currently on the board of directors for the Free Software Foundation, so I'm representing with my GNU shirt here. What I'm going to try to do today is uh, talk a bit about uh, free software advocacy and the way in which we engage in it. And I'm uh, going to start by briefly introducing one of, like, perhaps the major debate within the sort of broader free software community, which is the debate between free software on the one hand and open source. It's a, you know, 14 or 15 year, uh, I guess, 14 or 15 year old debate that most of, some of you at least are probably painfully familiar with, so I'll try to be short uh, in that sense. Um, but what I'm gonna try to do is, is argue that the promise of open source um, uh, is, which is more or less the template that many of us, including many people who talk about free software using the term free software as a form of advocacy, have relied upon is something which uh, uh, very often falls short. Um, we fall short of the promise of, uh, of open source. And what, uh, and subsequently, um, so that will be the sort of depressing part. That's the, the when free software isn't better part. And then hopefully in the more inspiring part of the talk in the end, I will focus on the ways in which free software is in fact inherently better, but not in the ways in which our advocacy has historically uh, tended to emphasize. Uh, all right, so um, the, Every, you know, I'm supposed to start a talk on free software, and I'm supposed to walk through the four freedoms so that we can all read, you know, like, repeat them in our uh, sleep. Um, uh, the four freedoms, of course, and this is the way in which people talk about it, uh, um, are, and the Free Software Foundation has defined it, are the freedom to run the software for any purpose, the freedom to study how the program works, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can learn, from, so you can help your neighbors, and of course the freedom to improve the program so you can help your uh, neighbors. Um, uh, I'm, uh, the, the way in which, uh, so, so this is the, the basic idea here. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about why I think that this is important and about how I tend to think of it. But I first um, uh, want to contrast this idea, this, uh, this sort of mode of talking about free software that really emphasizes a set of core freedoms with the, the, the open source uh, mission. And this is sort of the, the uh, no longer on the very first page of the Open Source Initiative webpage, but this is the, the was for the vast majority of the length of the organization. The mission is, you know, here, open source is a, is a development method for software that harnesses the power of distributed peer review and transparency of process. The promise of open source is uh, better quality, higher reliability, more flexibility, lower cost, and an end to predatory vendor lock-in. Now, there are two things that I want to point out in this sort of 
th this approach to thinking about advocacy, advocacy. The first is the statement about inherent quality, right? We're, you should use this stuff because it's really great. It's better quality than the proprietary alternatives. Um, uh, and when we look around at a lot of the pieces of free software that we advocate for, the GNU operating system, the Linux kernel, Apache, it's easy to see this quality in those projects. These are really great pieces of software that uh, you know, have lots of functionality, um, uh, seem to, don't seem to cost very much. They, uh, they seem to be really, uh, really great, um, high quality and reliable. But the second thing to point out here is actually some, is, is a part about process. It's about how this is supposed to happen. And what this comes down to is this idea uh, of distributed peer review. We, um, it's, it's this idea that, uh, that, that uh, a transparency of process. Um, and this was really, uh, so Eric, Eric Raymond, one of the people that founded the Open Source Initiative and helped write this text, um, uh, really talked about this process of, in, of distributed peer review at the core of open source and as a reason we wanted to advocate for open source in those terms. Um, and he coined, uh, uh, he coined this process, or he described this process as Linus's law. And some of you have probably heard this. Linus's law is given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, or more formally, given a large enough beta tester and co-developer base, almost every problem will be characterized quickly and the fix will be obvious to someone. So that's the basic, uh, that's the basic idea. And that's, that's what we mean by this process of distributed peer review. I'll make this very, very clear. Here is the model. Um, uh, this is why our stuff becomes high quality and very reliable and good. It's because when we publish our stuff openly, a community will come in and improve it. Um, and that through that process, we will get stuff that is very high quality because now all of these beta testers are you know, using the software and they can see the code, the source code, and they can fix stuff in the source code. And through that process, wow, uh, things get great <laughs> and our companies do really well and it's profit and it's wonderful. Um, so that was the model. Now, um, I've sometimes, uh, um, I don't know, so, so, so I don't know, how, how many people were using free software in... 19, in 2000. A few, wow, a bunch of you. Well, I don't know, that's maybe. Uh, well, that's good, I'm glad to see some people were a little bit, uh, we have some newcomers as well, but, so some of you remember this. Like, this, uh, if, you, if you remember in 1998 and around 2000, there was the period of the dot-com boom, and open source was really part of, uh, it, was, it was part of this, you know, coined is in, in part, of, like, uh, a, a, a way of selling this process that free software had done to all these communities who were creating startups, and it was very successful. It was very much caught up in this, and there were a bunch of big startups <laughs> that happened around the turn of the millennia, including Red Hat and VA Linux systems, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. <coughs> um, I sometimes call this the paleo Raymondus model. Um, uh, paleo Raymondus, both because it's old, paleo in terms of old, um, uh, all back to the battle days of 1988, but also because it's kind of out of date. Uh, history has taught us a few things about the way in which things happen or happen you know, frequently. So uh, that's where we, we're, we're now getting to the bad news. Um, um, and the, the reality, and the reality that a lot of us who've been participating in these communities for a long time have realized is that sometimes things don't work out quite as well as this model suggests. Sometimes we don't, sometimes we release free software, uh, sometimes we put stuff, make stuff open source and we don't profit. Um, uh, I, I, a lot of people have interpreted that, that model as, as meaning something like, if I take uh, you know, the GPL and I slap it on a piece of software uh, and I put it on a website, that people will start fixing my bugs and my software will become really great. Uh, um, and uh, I don't know, who here has released a piece of free software? Um, who here, uh, did that, does that like, match your experience? Um, in some cases it matches my experience. I, once or twice uh, it worked that way, uh, but not always. Um, and uh, the bad news is, is that it's not as easy as just releasing your stuff and letting the community come and fix your bugs. Uh, and all that stuff that I had up before about how great it is, is tr you know, true, this like, you know, distributed peer review, this high quality stuff. It happens like that sometimes, but not, not always. Um, and actually, not even often, uh, as it turns out. So anyway, uh, um, here's how I see it, uh, the bad news. Um, free software is often less featureful than proprietary software. Um, it is often lower quality. Uh, it is often worse for business. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, usually uncollaborative in its development. Uh, so I'll walk through each of those uh, uh, in time. So first, it's often less featureful. Um, so uh, in the early days of any free software project, before the features have been written, free software is less featureful <laughs> than the software that exists already and has features. Um, and in the later days, even when projects are mature, it is still often less featureful than, uh, um, than 
than competing projects. So this is a book that I got to know very well, Linux Device Drivers by Jonathan Corbett and uh, company. It's a great book on how to write device drivers for uh, the Linux kernel. I wish I didn't have to know this, um, <laughs> right? Uh, um, because sometimes, uh, sometimes you buy, it, you get a piece of hardware, and it comes with drivers, but not that runs for not if you're, not if you're running the, a Linux kernel on your machine. Um, I remember back um, when uh, in when I was 14 or 15 years old, I went to the store. I wanted to buy a CD-ROM drive, a CD-ROM drive, and you needed to have special support for your CD-ROM drive in the Linux kernel in order to run it. Um, I got a list of the three CD-ROM drives, which it was early days, were supported by the Linux kernel. Also, cost like a thousand dollars to buy a CD-ROM drive, and uh, I bought one of the three CD-ROM drives and took it home, and it didn't work because I got a newer revision that was not yet supported in the Linux kernel. Right? Um, the, the features aren't always they're not, they're not there, not at the very beginning. Um, of course, people had just not got or gotten around to it in that case, right? And eventually people did um, uh, do that. And of course, today, if you install uh, you know, your CD-ROM drive, if you even still have one, almost certainly works without your having to write a, de a device driver, but someone, of course, did. Um, uh, Linux is, of course, a mature project now. Um, and that problem, this problem of CD-ROM drives and many other device drivers is addressed. Um, other times, uh, feature development is hard, not just because people haven't gotten around to it, because it's actually just really hard. Sometimes features are really hard to develop. Sometimes they require uh, specialized knowledge. And sometimes the people that want the features don't have the skills or the time to be able to build them. Um, who, here is, who here has tried to edit video using free software? Uh, yes, uh, successfully, right? Uh, successfully, I have as well. Um, uh, uh, there are actually quite a few different free software tools that um, support uh, under active development, um, many of which have been under active development for more than a decade, which support video editing, right? Um, uh, and the software still lags heavily in terms of uh, basic features which are available in proprietary um, applications. I mean, we don't have to hide it, it's true. Uh, this is Final Cut Pro. Uh, this is a piece of proprietary software released by Apple. It's incredibly large. It's incredibly complicated. It is incredibly featureful. It has thousands of features. And those features are very valuable to at least some subset of the users of that software. But honestly, this is Final Cut. It's very expensive and complicated. I would be happy with a piece of free software which did what iMovie does, which is the, the version that Apple gives away for free. Um, and it did so reliably and without crashing and, uh, and that you know just had all of those features that sort of worked. Um, uh, this is... Uh, this is Cinelera. Uh, it's one of the um, it's one of the free software uh, uh, free software piece of video editing software. Um, it, it it runs on operating systems which are not Fedora now, uh, which is a uh, step forward from a time earlier in its life when I tried to use it. Uh, um, and uh, I once came and said, "Wow, you know." Uh, uh, um, and there are other pieces of software. I use PTV as well. I actually quite like it. But I think that even the most ardent advocates of free software and free software videos have to admit that today there's no, we're nowhere near feature parity between these pieces of software. Um, I will point out. I like this down. This is the this is the old Cinelera like icons. They had like this unsharp with like a picture of George Bush and, and like hand drawn like sort of uh, uh, like, tux, tux, tux paint icons. So there are benefits. Uh, there are, there are benefits. Th things that things that Final Cut might learn, right? Um, okay. Free software is not always um, as featureful. And even oh, I spelled free software. Sort of, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I redid these slides this uh, this morning and missed a few things. So yeah. Uh, uh, questions of uh, uh, questions of uh, quality are sometimes related to features. So um, it may be that although Cinelera doesn't do everything that Final Cut does at the moment, it may do the things that it does very well. Uh, it may also not be that that way as well. Um, uh, who here used an Open Mocha? Do people remember Open Mocha? Yeah, I had one too. Um, uh, the so for people that uh, um, who knows what's going on here of the Open Mocha users, does anyone know what these people are doing? Um, uh, they're fixing something, that's for sure. Um, uh, so the Open Oco was uh, a phone, pictured right here, which aimed to be the, and succeeded to be, the world's m most free, most hackable phone. Um, and I'll come and talk about it later in the talk because there are a lot of things that I liked about it. But although OpenMoco was and still is the world's freest phone, it's not the world's ha most high quality phone as measured along a number of different dimensions. Uh, um, uh, one of the things that uh, people like to do with their phones is call people. Um, uh, uh, and uh, and, and, and OpenMoco did that. Uh, um, uh, they also like to, sometimes when they call people, they like to hear the other people on the other end of the line. And OpenMoco was sometimes less good at that part. Um, there was a problem with OpenMoco where it had this like really loud buzzing sound related to certain kinds of GPS, uh, not G, uh, uh, GSM stations. And uh, basically there was this loud buzzing noise that was audible to the person who was calling. You, you could not hear the other person. And so these people are, in, are at, a bug, at a buzz fix party where they are re-soldering a capacitor 
in their phones so that they can uh, so that they can hear the other side of their conversations reliably. Um, uh, sometimes the free stuff doesn't work better out of the box. Um, uh, uh, Network Manager. Um, it's, I think, sort of safe to pick on Network Manager now because I think it's actually a really high-quality piece of software today, but it wasn't always a high-quality piece of software, uh, as the picture suggests. <laughs> People will remember seeing this. Um, this is just sort of uh, how, many t how many hours of your life as free software users have you spent like, in a, that limbo state of trying to connect to a network but not being able to connect to it while, right? Like how many hours are like like right uh, and, and and like while your friends with Max were like sitting there like like you know. uh, right uh, I remember uh, um, I remember that feeling uh, sometimes uh, sometimes free software doesn't work as well um, sometimes free software doesn't uh, lead to good business in fact sometimes it leads to bad business and I mentioned earlier that uh, free software was sort of sold that the, the open source was really used as a way of selling free software to a business community especially around you know uh, you know 15 years ago or so and uh, was very successful at doing so um, uh, the idea of course was that free software gets better so that you can because people change um, um, because free software is better you could charge more because you had all these volunteers fixing your bugs you would save on your costs and it would be profit right um, development costs go down you make loads of money um, uh, that was the basic idea and uh, uh, um, as I suggested going into the height of the dot-com bubble free um, uh, free software were was these arguments were being made very, in a very widespread way about about open source <laughs> And um, uh, they and many of the advocates of open source and people who coined it were very involved in a lot of big um, big startups. However, only a small number of the companies that were created during that period to promote open source ever became successful enough to become uh, public companies, for example. And uh, um, uh, in fact, there were seven, uh, I think, that I, that I counted. Um, VA Linux systems uh, you may have heard of, Red Hat, um, Andover, Cobalt, uh, uh, Cobalt, and Caldera. And although data on these companies is far from a strong evaluation of the sort of wisdom of a free software business model more generally, um, it suggests that maybe the way in which they performed was less than one might like all the time. Um, this is a description of the market capitalization for all, every free software IPO, uh, every co company uh, over time. Um, uh, so this is the dot-com boom. And you can see these companies became worth a lot. Uh, the red line is Red Hat, um, uh, which uh, became worth a lot of money and is actually still a very successful company today. Um, uh, the blue line is VA Linux Systems, which was the single biggest IPO, in, most successful IPO in history, still. 750% um, or something like this, 730% uh, increase in their valuation. I mean, it's not that that was a good decision for the people who made the IPO, but uh, it was a very, it was a, uh, and actually most people believe that the reason they were valued so highly was because their stock ticker system was LNUX. Yes. And everyone thought that they were just like buying Linux. Like, I want to invest in Linux. Um, uh, and so they bought in VA and they found out later and sold it or something. Um, uh, um, uh, and so this is the dot com boom and bust. Um, um, but it's also true that lots of proprietary companies got slammed here as well. Um, uh, um, so we can compare this kind of market capitalization for all the free software companies to all the, all the other dot-com companies that had their IPOs in the same period. And we can say, did these companies really do much, much better or worse? So here is the market capitalization for all NASDAQ IPOs during uh, this period of, I forget, 90, I, I have it. I have the data, I'm happy to share. Um, but uh, during this period of time, and then this is the market capitalization for just the free software companies. And you actually see that they fall a little bit harder up front, but it looks pretty similar. Um, pretty similar. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that this is only true because of Red Hat. Um, if Red Hat weren't in this, this number would go to zero, like basically indistinguishable from zero. Um, uh, Red Hat has been an enormous success, and without Red Hat, the story of public free software companies would be like without even a possible silver lining, uh, um, which is. Uh, uh, um, they're really an exceptional company. Um, if we look at the, um, but, but this is, I think, the more instructive uh, graph. This is the combined market capitalization for all the NASDAQ IPOs, and this little blue line, which is basically flat the entire way, is the combined market capitalization for all free software companies, like put together. And it's like basically on the bottom still, um, uh, despite a lot of experience and despite Red Hat's success, which is tracking more or less the market of other companies which released at that time, there hasn't been a big rush to create free software companies. Um, uh, it does, it, if anything, it's gotten a little bit worse than it was in that earlier period. Um, uh, free software may not be the poison pill for business, um, uh, but uh, and I don't think that there's any evidence that it is. It looks like it's about as good for business as all the other businesses that were created in that period, but it doesn't look like it's obviously better. Okay. Um, 
so it's hard to square. Uh, um, so so this, the second point here is, is around the idea that free software is often uncollaborative. And this is the one that, uh, um, uh, and, and, and it's sometimes hard to square some of what I've already shown you with Linus's law, right? Like if, really, if, if just making our software free were enough, if just making it open and inviting people in, we would expect there to be lots of great stuff. How can free software be so bad when anyone can come in and just fix those bugs, right? Um, like why, why, why didn't someone just fix those network manager bugs? Um, why didn't someone just add those features to Similera? Um, uh, and the reason it's um, bad, in spite of this, all this collaborative collaboration, is because there actually isn't a lot of collaboration. Uh, um, let's go back to the paleo images model. Um, we have a three-step process. We publish stuff openly, the community improves our stuff, and we get higher software. And I believe, I actually kind of believe the second part of this model, right? I believe that if a community comes in and starts working on stuff, that through this process of lots of people working on it, we will get stuff that is higher quality, and that maybe even we will get profit, uh, at least understood very broadly, social profit, perhaps. Uh, um, but uh, what I want to suggest, and what many other people who've tried to do this in this room have already, I think, noticed, is that there's a missing piece of this puzzle right here, right? Uh, there's something about attracting a community which is harder than I think a lot of us have assumed that it uh, would be. So out of, for, because we, we spend a lot of time celebrating our successes as a community, right? Um, all of the great projects that we've created. And we've missed a very important fact that for every successful project that has attracted a lot of contributors, a whole bunch of projects have failed to do so. Um, uh, so uh, what do people think the median number of contributors are? And if you've seen my talk before or some version of this, don't answer. But it, what do you people think the median number of contributors are to a, to a free software and open source project? Zero. Zero. It can't be zero. Uh, uh, <laughs> have you never seen somebody who come who contributes detrimentally. Uh, uh, <laughs> so your answer is one. Uh, 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 negative. Negative five. Uh, yeah. Um, three? That's a nice answer. Any other guesses? Ten. Ten. Uh, so the median is one. So you're basically as close to right as you can be. Um, uh, the price is right rules. Uh, the price is right rules. Uh, I don't know what those are, but uh, yes. Um, uh, the median is one. This is data from SourceForge, which is just one uh, uh, easily available data set. Um, uh, and this is actually kind of cheating, because this is all projects, right? This includes ideas for projects, which are the ones with maybe R0. I mean, it takes someone to start it, so someone has to be signed up. Um, uh, what do people think the, um, what about it? What if, we, what if we limit it to mature or very, very mature projects? Projects that have been marked as mature on SourceForge. What do people think the median number of contributors are then? 300, two. 302. How does SourceForge decide what to mark as mature? Uh, the creators of the project decide. One. <laughs> <laughs> Such faith in your fellow developers. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Ten. Ten. One. Uh, for introduction, uh, the median numbers are one. Okay, but that's unfair because these projects might just be marked by people that don't really, they're just aspirationally mature, right? What if we look at projects that are actually mature? The, 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 the most downloaded projects, 100 downloads or more within the last, uh, I forget, three months, six months. Uh, I have the data available, but um, the last several months. What do you think that median numbers of contributors? One. Uh, it's two. <laughs> uh, um, okay, but this is unfair. Who uses SourceForge anymore? How about Google Code? Right, median number of contributors in Google Code. One. Uh, uh, but what if we look at projects which Google marks as being very active? It'll be better then, right? The median number of active Google projects, one. Uh, um, and what's crazy is these graphs are like all the same. Like the, the yeah. scale changes here, but like uh, the distribution is all exactly the same. What about GitHub public repositories? The median number of people that are we don't even have to we don't even have to look at contributors. What about median number of watchers to a GitHub repository? <laughs> median number of contributors? <laughs> one. One. Point, point one. No, it's one. Uh, the median the median is one. The median is always one. The answer is median, except when it's two. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, I've gotten these for Launchpad, I've gotten these for Savannah, I've gotten these for lots of different types of projects. Even if you look at projects that have been downloaded thousands of times and released three times in the last six months, we see that the median number of contributors is one or maybe two. Um, uh, uh, the the most the, the reason that the, the the reason that it's sometimes not that free software projects are not like not always higher quality is at least in part because they're not collaborative. They're simply uncollaborative most of the time. Even if we believe in the power of distributed review, most projects, most free software, most open source projects will never realize the power of distributed peer review because there's only one, like it's distributed across the one person who's ever contributed to it, right? Um, uh, it just never happens, right? So that's the bad news. Uh, but uh, um, I think, and I think that is bad news. It's bad because I wish it wasn't true. 
all those things, everything there. Um, as an advocate and like a lifelong advocate and participant in free software, um, I wish these things weren't true. Uh, it means, and it also because it means that I sometimes, as someone who uses only free software, it means that I often use software which is not as good as I would like, um, at least sometimes. Um, it's also bad because it means as advocates, uh, as advocates for free software, as for open source, um, uh, something that I have done and many, I think other people in this room have done as well, we're being dishonest. Um, we're talking about the high quality of our stuff and this great stuff that will come out of this process and it doesn't always or even usually happen that way. Um, we're engaging in false advertising and we're making claims about our product that we basically can't back up. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also bad because it means we're not, we're not uh, focused on making our stuff better. We're, so, we're too busy going out and telling everyone about how inherently superior our stuff is that we don't like spend some of that time maybe making our stuff uh, less inferior, uh, at least in some cases. Um, uh, um, uh, right. But um, uh, the good news, I don't know, maybe, maybe, the good news for me is that this is not the end of my talk, uh, hopefully for you as well. Um, I actually wrote an essay uh, with this title, uh, When Free Software Isn't Better, and distributed it. It kind of ended like about here, um, uh, uh, in a way that people were like, that is so depressing. Uh, um, uh, and actually, people were like accusing me of FUD. They were like, you know, you're being paid off by Microsoft, that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, the good news is my talk isn't over. Um, uh, well, depending about how you feel about my talk, I suppose, um, might be good news. The the uh, the, the, that, that would be free software isn't better. That's the talk. Uh, this is when free software isn't better. It's about what we're going to do then, right? Um, because I do think that free software is better. I mean, I believe it's inherently better. In, um, uh, and, and not inherently better, but just not inherently better in the ways in which I think that the sort of the open source model has led us to talk about. Uh, um, uh, uh, it, not, not in the ways it might lead us to believe. Now, um, I want to suggest that by focusing on freedom, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can offer a more honest and in the long term a more effective path for advocacy around free software and also a more effective path for organizing. Um, first, we can focus on a set of inherent, like actually inherent benefits of freedom. Um, and second, um, uh, if we do believe that practical issues matter, and I, and I do believe that, I'm not one of these, I'm not standing here to tell you like, forget about like, free software is bad, keep using it, uh, everybody, because you'll live in freedom. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that there are inherent benefits, um, and that they do matter, and that they matter to me, and that they're, and that they're um, things that we can begin talking about, and ways in which we can begin organizing our work. Um, in the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about, it, about six inherent benefits of freedom. Um, uh, and those are... First, the fact that free software is resistant to anti-features. Second, that free software makes uh, failure cheap. Third, that it makes success cheap. Um, uh, uh, fourth, that it resists uh, centralized control. Fifth, that it can sometimes lead, sometimes lead to massive collaboration. And sixth, um, uh, fundamentally, because it gives users more freedom. All right. Um, the first idea here is around anti-features, and it's okay if you're sitting here saying, like, what is an anti-feature? I made the term up, uh, um, uh, so you don't have to know it, but I do. An anti-feature is a feature which is, uh, an anti-feature is a feature, like in a piece of software, but unlike a feature which is designed so that users will uh, like it and maybe even want to, like, maybe, that, um, you know, in some maybe want to pay to get it, an anti-feature is, is something which is designed into a piece of proprietary software so that users can pay to have it taken out. Um, uh, there are things that are designed to be so bad, added functionality, <coughs> negative functionality, which is designed to be so bad that people will pay to not have that functionality. Now you may be saying, like, what? Like, and, like really? Uh, they're everywhere. Anti-features are everywhere. Um, and here's a concrete example. Did anyone remember Windows NT Workstation 4.0? You're like, oh yeah, I love that. Uh, no, um, so, so this is actually one of my very favorite stories about an anti feature. Uh, uh, it was um, uh, Windows. Microsoft released two versions of NT um, uh, 4.0. They released a version for workstations and a version for servers. And um, uh, the version for uh, uh, Microsoft described them as two very different products intended for two very different functions. And they claimed that the server version was, for example, suited and tailored for use, being used as an internet server, but what but uh, workstation version was, in the words of Microsoft, grossly inadequate. Um, uh, uh, the most clear indication of this was that the workstation version could only make 10 concurrent TCP IP connections at a time. Uh, which, like, the way in which people use websites now is just, like, ridiculous. The, like, the internet would not work um, currently. But at the time, you could, if you wanted to use more than 10 connections, you had to pay more money for the server version. Now, um, uh, a lot of people noticed that these pieces of software were, um, uh, were very similar. Um, uh, in fact, um, like, Someone noticed they were so similar that they took all the files and they hashed them that they were like exactly the same size and actually exactly the same files. Windows NT Workstation and Windows NT Server were the exact same piece of software. The difference was is that there was one bit set in the registry which told the computer that it was a, uh, a workstation. And if it was a workstation, it would, it would invoke a whole bunch of code that Microsoft had written to, for, to basically turn off functionality 
within the system and to en enable new functionality like the system which would monitor the number of active TCP connections that you had and limit you to 10 at a time, right? Um, uh, there was a set of engineers whose job it was to build this functionality and test it, right? And the, I mean, the users were very happy when they found out about this because they could have an $800 upgrade of uh, Windows NT by flipping one bit in the registry and their computer was like, uh, could do lots of things that it couldn't do before. Now, um, uh, uh, of course, this was in 1996. Things are different now. This is Windows 7. Uh, Windows 8 has four <laughs> versions. They've uh, narrowed it down, but this is, there, I want to talk about Windows 7 starter um, in a way uh, um, uh, because it's a great story. Um, uh, you can choose, to this day, you can choose between many versions of Windows. Today it's four in Windows 8. In Windows 7 it was seven. Uh, and the, um, and uh, for the most part, the difference to this day are things like how much memory you want to be able to use on your computer. If you want to use more memory, you have to buy a more expensive version of Windows. Of course, limiting the amount of memory that you can use on your system is an anti-feature, which is built into the system. There are anti-features up and down this. Windows 7 Starter I loved because um, it, in addition to being limited to two gigs of memory, the other anti-features were that you couldn't change the wallpaper. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, and there was actually an, another version w w of Windows 7 which they had designed but um, uh, never existed, which would limit you to three working applications, like three running applications with a graphical interface. They had, there, there was a, um, the, 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 the Windows Starter and the other versions based on it were designed to be as bad, they were basically given away for almost no money, um, or for very little amounts of money, with the idea being that anyone who could afford to, that it would be so bad that anyone who had enough money to buy a better version of Windows would, right? It was designed to be like very, very, as bad as possible, um, uh, so that people would only put up with it if they had to. Um, and this is the way in which proprietary software works. I have an entire talk where I focus just on these kinds of um, uh, just on these kinds of anti features. And the beautiful thing is that anti features are impossible in the context of free software, right? Um, not that you can't build an anti feature in free software; you can. But 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 anti features are only possible are our way of exploiting users. And free software gives users the ability to choose whether or not they want a particular feature, to choose whether or not they want to be exploited. And you can guess how people usually choose uh, in, in, in that case, right? Can you imagine like like? Ubuntu, uh, Ubu the Ubuntu version that wouldn't let you change your background? I mean, not that someone, th 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 not that it's Im impossible to imagine Canonical doing that. I used to work at Canonical. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, but, 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 but how long would it take for someone to take the software that they had released and make a new version, right? We don't have to guess. People have already taken versions of Canonical software and done lots of things with it, right? Um, uh, um, building in new features and removing anti-features. The result is the anti-features can't exist in the long term in the free world. That's an inherent advantage, right? It's something, like, we don't have to talk about what we've done. We can talk about what we can't do. Um, uh, and that's a lot. Uh, th that's a real delta for a lot of users. Uh, can I add yeah. I think Windows Starter was also only sold in certain countries also. Uh, yeah, there was a where, developing where, world where, edition, right? Yeah, when they were selling it in certain countries. where they sold were... in the U.S. and Europe. Actually, where people... no, it was sold, uh, Windows 7 Starter was, is, was sold in the U.S. Yeah, it's sold it's mostly on yeah. that. There, there continues to be multiple versions of okay. Windows 8, which are which exist and are only sold in different places, which have less features and additional anti-features. So those do exist today. Um, I mean, anti-features haven't gone away. I mean, like dongles, people have, like, like, like who's ever been like, you know, this software is really great. The only problem is, is that I can run it without finding a piece of hardware to plug into the side of my computer, right? Uh, you know, it's just like, I think this software would be really much better if I had to, like, find a USB key and have it with me everywhere that I wanted to use the software, right? No one's ever asked for this. Um, they're, 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 forced on, they're forced on users and not on users of free software. All right. Uh, I want to go back to those graphs, um, or at least think about those graphs that I showed earlier, right? Because it's possible that, uh, um, uh, that all those people don't, uh, that, that all those, I mean, I, I showed those projects as sort of failures, right? All these projects that had no one, you know, no one contributing to them, or at least just the person who created them. But, it's, but, but, but they need not be failures. And in fact, uh, there's, uh, there's a really great study which was done by um, uh, this guy Charlie Schweik and Bob English, two, 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 two guys at um, University of Massachusetts, where they went out and they interviewed a bunch of people that had released pieces of free software, and they asked them what they thought success was. Um, and they said, I don't know, if I've released it a few times over and built a user base over a period of month, uh, months, then I consider that success, right? And even among their successful projects, they still found that the majority of them had one uh, contributor, right? That those projects weren't, um, uh, that, that they, and even if you went to the people and you said, okay, like, do you consider this project a failure? And they were like, yes, absolutely. This project was a complete failure, right? They didn't seem that upset about it um, for the most part because um, uh, 
uh, because uh, the, the the majority of the, the the vast majority of pieces of software were we're ninety eight percent of all pieces of software on SourceForge were failures in the eyes of their creators, at least according to their surveys. But but everyone was basically okay with it because because uh, because failure is cheap. Um, uh, free software is for the most part not created inside uh, the context of organizations or startups. Um, they uh, nobody loses equity on their house if their free software project tanks. Uh, for the most part, Not, nobody loses their parents or friends' money. Um, it took, in most cases, most of those, the vast majority of projects out there—not all of them, but most of them—it uh, was a, it was a few minutes, a few hours, maybe a few days, and it was mostly just for fun to begin with, right? Um, it was someone trying to do something, and we threw it, we threw it out there with the idea that maybe other people would want to use it, and if they did, that's awesome, and if they didn't, okay. I mean, that's been my experience at least. The um, uh, the developer of those projects solved their problems. They had fun. They learned something, and um, and through the and and, uh, and and that's okay. But it's actually even better than that. The, the the benefit of making failure cheap is not just that like it's not a big problem. It's that we actually can gain through this um, uh, through the idea of finding a runaway success, right? So so you can think of it in this way. Um, uh, th if we so I, I'm I used to be an innovation scholar. I guess I still am an innovation scholar. Uh, uh, innovation scholars like to think of uh, like innovation landscapes, right? There's like th there are these there are these local maximas that you might want to get up on in some space, right? So you can think of this as like a feature space, and 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 and, and we're we're. All, we can't see anything here. We don't know where the good things are. What we do is we're trying to, you know, we're trying to solve a particular problem, and um, and we try to get a little better, a little better, a little better, and we get, and, and and most of the time we end up on some local maxima or another, right? But the fact that we made it to the top of this little hill or this little bump doesn't mean that, that we made made the best project ever, because someone else with a different project might be able to find a much better place, right? That we just couldn't see based on the way in which we were approaching the problem. Now. Now, now, the fact that there were um, uh, uh, many free software projects um, uh, get to explore a wide space, and it's very, very normal to find like dozens, in some cases even hundreds of pieces of free software that do exactly the same thing, right? But they do it slightly differently, and they do it differently in a way that means that they get to explore a larger portion of the de design space. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, if you think about it as like, you know, like, like. There's a lot of randomness um, to creating a successful thing in the world, right? A successful business and certainly a successful um, uh, project. And because failure is cheap, we can try lots and lots of things. Um, and as a result, uh, although most of those will, become, um, uh, uh, will not be the most successful projects, some of them will be more successful than they would have been if, we, if, if our mode of development caused, uh, required more resources in order to do. Um, uh, for every successful free software project, you can find a bunch of failures. Um, and actually, I have a nice—I won't talk about it here—but I have a—I have a—I've done a—I've done a study where I look at eight attempts to create online collaborative encyclopedia projects uh, before Wikipedia. Um, uh, some of which, uh, one of which involved the same uh, founders of Wikipedia, none of which really. None of which obviously became Wikipedia, except for Wikipedia, which became Wikipedia. Um, some of them looked superficially more like Wikipedia that did um, than Wikipedia did uh, when it was first. Uh, Wikipedia does than Wikipedia did when it was first created. Um, uh, we can explore lots of things because the, because failure is cheap in most of these cases. Uh, but it's more than that. Um, it's not just failure that becomes cheap. Uh, uh, free software also makes success cheap. Now, um, another way of looking at what I've just said is that it's, um, uh, uh, is that it's, 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 if it's easy to fail in free software, it's also very easy to succeed. To succeed in commercial software, most commercial software, and almost all proprietary software is uh, commercial, one, uh, one needs to make money. And most, and that's, uh, most free software projects are not as constrained. Um, so in surveys of free software developers, what we found is that, uh, that I've already mentioned, people described if it released a few times and maybe got a few users, that was great. Um, uh, you can't build a company on that. Uh, uh, most developers, most free software developers, their projects are successful because they've solved their own problem. And this is one thing that um, Eric Raymond said as well, and which was very true, that many, um, uh, that, that many people contribute to free software projects simply because they're scratching their own itch, they're solving their own problems. Um, uh, now, now, I think that, that, uh, that uh, if people are participating because they find the act of, um, this it ends up being uh, true in a few ways. Um, sometimes it means that people find the act of participating enjoyable itself, and if that's the case, then all of those projects are successful, right? Every project, every free software project is a success because I had fun doing it and I solved my own problem. Uh, um, uh, and 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 this makes sense because you know if we weren't having fun, we'd all be playing Tox Racer instead or 
whatever it is that we do. Um, um, but it's even better because what counts as external success like um, is also different in the context of free software. It's not just like what I personally as a developer of this piece of software um, find uh, important. Does anyone know uh, Haiku or uh, Aros? Uh, so so these, these are great. So Haiku is an implementation, a re-implementation of an operating system called B, uh, BIOS, BIOS, BOS? I don't know. Yeah. BIOS? BIOS. BIOS. BIOS, and Aros is, uh, or Haiku, the Aros is a re-implementation of Amiga OS. Now, what's important to realize is that Haiku and, uh, um, Haiku and Aros are not commercially successful, like, operating systems. Um, not only are they not commercially successful operating, operating systems, they are re-implementations of commercially unsuccessful <laughs> operating systems. Uh, like, uh, like, the reason that there's a free software project to create these things is because the proprietary version went out of business. They couldn't support themselves, right? <laughs> Um, and there are there were a few people around who loved those systems and who cared about them enough that they were able to continue to work on them, right? Probably not even enough to pay a few developers to work on it, right? Not enough people loved it or not enough people loved it enough to maybe even pay more than a few, uh, a few developers or even that much, but they were willing to solve their own problems and they were willing to, um, uh, and they were willing to build their own systems. And in that sense, although they are trying to, although they are re-implementing commercial failures, these are huge successes um, because they're solving people's problems. Right? The bar is lower. Success is cheaper in free software. Uh, another benefit of free software is, uh, is, uh, is that free software is robustly independent. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, by virtue of the fact that anyone can modify it, the second freedom, um, uh, and collaborate with others, free software is actually resistant to lock-in and dependence <coughs> in a way that proprietary software is not. And so this goes back to the open source mission. This thing about uh, avoiding predatory vendor lock-in, which I've highlighted right here, is something which I want to point out because it's really true. And I want to give credit to this because I think that that's right. Um, in many ways, uh, free software is resistant to vendor lock-in in a way that uh, in a way that proprietary software isn't. Um, this happens in many ways. It's often related to anti-features. It's often one, an important. Uh, um, um, and, but I think it's also worth noting that not all. Uh, and that's an example of predatory lock-in and something that can happen in predatory lock-in. But it's worth pointing out that not all lock-in is predatory. Sometimes, well-meaning people become bottlenecks. They be, um, uh, and this happens even in the context of free software. Um, uh, and the fact that we don't have to depend on any one of them is a real advantage um, that free software always has. Uh, does anyone here know Gnome Guild? People remember this? No one. Sodipodi? Anybody? A few people? Inkscape? Yes! Uh, Inkscape is a, one of my favorite pieces of free software. I think it's really, really fantastic. I use it all the time. Um, uh, but there's a long history here. Because Inkscape uh, was uh, built off of a piece of software called Sodipodi. Um, which was written by a person who uh, basically was taking the software in a direction that the other members of the community didn't like and was not developing it as actively as they wanted, and so people forked it, and they created the Inkscape project. They went off on their own way, and Sodipodi existed in parallel for a period of time. Uh, back when I was working in Ubuntu, we were deciding whether or not to switch, and we decided to move over to Inkscape because it was unclear. Both projects were developed um, simultaneously. But, in, but Sodipodi was itself... Um, actually a fork of an, of, a, of an older piece of software called Gnome Guild, which no one knows about because it was never very successful. Um, but it was created by, um, uh, uh, it was created by uh, Raph Levine, the guy who did uh, like Ghost Script and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and a uh, brilliant developer did a bunch of great work. Um, uh, uh, and so we had this, and, and this process was possible. Inkscape was only possible because when the person who was writing the piece of software decided to become uninterested, uh, became uninterested, or just like became busy and stopped answering emails or stopped taking the direction, other people could take it in and build off and work on it. The software was independent in a way that allowed people to take it in different directions and to build it into what is a fantastic piece of software today in a way that would have been impossible in the context of proprietary software. It just would have stagnated. That kind of independence is an inherent benefit of free software. Um, the, the fifth uh, benefit of, uh, inherent benefit of free software is that free software can be very collaborative. Now, um, uh, and I want because I've talked a lot about how it can, but I want to emphasize that it does, right? This is uh, on a Libra Planet t-shirt that I really like. Uh, I'm not wearing the t-shirt, I should have thought to do that. Um, but this is, uh, you can probably recognize most of, or most or many, everyone's like, ah, oh, that's that. Uh, um, try to recognize many of the characters up here. Um, uh, uh, sometimes free software leads to better stuff, and not just a little bit better, but impossibly better stuff. 
Um, there's this paper that I like that estimates the cost of building Debian, and um, and it's and it's like billions of dollars. So it's a paper that estimates the cost and hours of building Wikipedia through a traditional encyclopedic model. And I've always found these questions kind of silly. So Debian would cost twenty one billion dollars to build in the traditional way, but it's it's kind of crazy because no company on earth would would ever decide to spend $21 billion to build a free operating system, an operating system and everything, including the software to run your dentist office, right? Which is in Debian, or Domsa Linux. Um, uh, um, uh, it's actually too big to do that way. It's too comprehensive. Um, it serves too many small markets. Uh, um, anyone who spent as much time in the, uh, like, I, you know, I, I think I might, I sometimes have joked that I think that, like, Debian is, like, the least efficient mode of building an operating system. If you spent time, like, arguing with people on Debian mailing lists, you'll know what I mean. Uh, um, uh, but, um, um, or the, the Wikipedia may be the least efficient form of building an encyclopedia that we've ever come about. Um, uh, um, but, and, but, but I think that the question of efficiency is sort of wrong here, because uh, our choice is not between sort of Debian produced in the free way and Debian produced in the proprietary way, because you couldn't produce Debian in the proprietary way. Um, uh, we have the opportunity not just to make, uh, we, we sometimes can make stuff that's not just really great, but actually much better than what would be possible in the proprietary, uh, in, in a proprietary model. Um, sometimes free software succeeds, sometimes it succeeds uh, enormously. Um, but the fourth, uh, but the final point that I want to make is that I think we've done a huge disservice to the free software community by talking about software freedom instead of user freedom. Because the inherent benefit of free software, and the most important thing to emphasize, is that free software gives users um, freedom. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I showed the free software definition early on, but I, but I think that um, uh, that's not really the way that I like to talk about it. I like to talk about it in a way that emphasizes control and autonomy and empowerment. Uh, um, I often do this anecdote about mobile phones, and I'll do it very quickly here. But if I want to send a, if I want to send a like a, a message to my partner Mika, who can't be here because she's searching for mushrooms in the woods right now, um, I can, if she has access to the a text message, I can send her a text message, and I can try to send a message to her. Or I could take a picture of you all, uh, and uh, and I could send a picture to her there. Hey, everybody. Uh, don't worry, I won't put it online. Uh, but, uh, 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 or I could, and then I can send a very different kind of message, right? Like a picture message is a very different kind of thing than a text message. Or I could call her up and I could sing a song in a way that would be able to communicate a very different kind of message. The point here is, is that these are all features which have been built into my phone and which, depending on her phone, you know, will, be, will facilitate very different kinds of messages. But it means that the person who's programming that phone, who's building those features in, has an enormous amount of power. They can determine, like, what I can say. Right? They can determine how I can say it. They can determine who I can say it to. And the issue there is that, the, 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 that that's an enormous amount of political power. And to the extent that my life is mediated by technology that I use to communicate, the, the question of who controls that technology becomes an enormously important political question. Right? And free software is an answer to that question. It says that the answer of who should control that is you, users. Right? We should control the software that we use. And every <coughs> piece of free software, even when it's not better along other dimensions, is better in that dimension. It means that it works the way that you want, or can work the way in which you want. Um, I'll end with uh, 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 going back to OpenMoGo, because OpenMoGo had a lot of problems in ways that I've detailed. Um, uh, uh, but, but, but mobile phones are really important uh, in all of our lives, right? Um, uh, they, 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 uh, they, ha they are, um, you know, they are the, the, this is like a sort of dystopian future, right? A system which I trust with all of my closest secrets, um, uh, all of my communication controlled in, for almost everybody by companies that we don't trust at all. Um, uh, and uh, in ways that we know are abused, in ways that like m makes, would make most, make most of us itch. Uh, OpenMoco, uh, uh, your mobile phone has a microphone, a camera, a series of sensors. It's constantly connected to the phone company's computers. It's, you, it's as I suggested, trusted with your, with, with your most intimate personal information. It runs software that you cannot see and cannot change. Um, uh, that software uh, um, is, is rewritten and changed without your permission or knowledge by the phone company routinely. Um, and it is controlled completely and totally by organizations you do not trust. Um, uh, and we know they are secretly giving our data away. Um, OpenMoco didn't do many things. Um, but some of the things that it didn't do were pretty great. Uh, um, uh, and even if most people don't think about it, freedom is worth something. And that's something that, are, that's where our advocacy must begin. Um, so uh, I'll just end really uh, briefly with this idea, this, a bunch of successful projects up here. Because um, I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, I think the only unforgivable failure is that we are not systematically learning from our mistakes. Uh, um, we're not we're not comparing our successes to our failures to learn why this stuff doesn't um, uh, doesn't always work. There's a great uh, um, there's a great uh, 
economist I know named Fabio Landini who uh, describes free software as being uh, what he calls a cultural subsidy. Basically, he has an economic model which says if you found proprietary software, um, it, it, a world with proprietary software can work, can work and you have uh, another world in which free, in, free software can also work as well and be equally successful in a way that those graphs suggest. Um, uh, that, that uh, why would anyone ever go out and try to discover the free software model? And the reason he suggests is because there's, there's activists and advocates who are willing to use free software when it's not better, who are willing to develop it and make it better. Um, because through that process, we can discover a higher point on that graph. We can, build, we can build something which is inherently better by taking advantage of the inherent benefits. But it will only happen if we provide that cultural subsidy, if we put in our time and effort to make it better. So the answer is, um, uh, um, when free software isn't better, what do we do? We fix it. Um, we make it better. Um, because we all can benefit from freedom. So uh, thank you all for coming and listening to me. Uh,